Welcome to the webinar. You have entered as an organizer and may now speak to any other organizers or panelists on the line. When you are ready to begin the presentation, press the Start Broadcast button on the Go Hello, to Webinar everybody. Control this Panel. Is, uh, to allow Thank all you for attendees uh, joining you. The system will notify you once you begin your broadcast. We're going to work on some technical stuff here. Just we're going to work on some technical stuff here just for a second. Oh, I think we're good. Okay. Good. So this is this is a very interesting format. Uh, doing webinars is something that I am um, getting used to doing. So I feel like I'm talking to my computer. So bear with me um, while I get my own bearings here. Um, we are really excited to have this unique opportunity. Um, and wanted to give, we're just going to give a few more minutes to allow a few people to join us. Okay, so um, first what we're going to do to go through some logistics. I was going to do this later, but I'm just going to do it right now. Uh, we have everybody muted just to make sure that we don't have any feedback. Uh, it would be helpful, too, just if you mute your phones for when we do unmute you, that it doesn't open up a whole bunch of feedback. Um, Renee Tetrick is going to moderate our questions today using the message board. It's possible for you to submit questions using the chat box, and you may also raise your hand. We are going to be able to answer clarifying questions as needed, and we can unmute you so that you can ask the question when it comes up. At the end, we'll also send out an FAQ after the call with a recorded link. I, joining us on the call, we have Teresa Hawley, who is the Executive Director of the Governor's Office of Early Childhood Development. Renee is going to unmute Teresa. She's going to share a few welcoming remarks, and she will be available on the call to answer questions as needed. So Teresa, I'm going to turn it over to you um, for a few minutes. Thank you. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Yay. Um, so welcome and thank you everyone for joining the webinar today. Um, as we all know the preschool development grant is a really exciting opportunity for our state to make uh, significant progress on thinking about how we find those kids and families who have the highest needs in our communities and find them early and provide them um, continuous and high quality and appropriately intensive support through those early childhood years right into the kindergarten through third grade years. The innovation zones are a great strategy that we have developed in our state for supporting communities as they think about how do we find those kids who are most at risk, how do we link them up into services, and how do we create a more seamless experience for families as they move through our different types of programs and different funding streams that may be able to support them at the different stages of their young kids' development and their development as a family. So our state's vision, as we all know, is that every child will enter kindergarten safe, healthy, ready to succeed, and eager to learn. And in order to do that, we have to have um, high quality services for young kids and families to be able to access, but we also need to have a system that makes sense for families, for them to be able to move through. We know that this doesn't happen from state level alone. In fact, it won't happen at all unless people on the ground are actually working together to create um, appropriate systems and gap-free systems of services that are really meeting the needs of young kids and families. When our vision as a state is realized, we're going to see all young kids' needs being met, including their early childhood education needs, their physical and mental health, and the family support needs that will really make the difference for the long-term success of these young children. So I'm very excited about today's webinar and the process that we're going to go through here to select some additional communities for intensive support and help in thinking about how do we find these young kids and families? How do we get them into programs, keep them in 
um, in services all the way through their early childhood years and ensure that those services that they're in are of the quality and intensity they need to be to make a lasting difference in those young children and families' lives. So um, I, again, appreciate your being here today. I think we'll you'll be able to learn a lot about what the Innovation Zone process looks like, and I look forward to continuing to work with you on all of this work. So I'm going to turn it back over to Leah now. Thank you very much, Teresa. I appreciate that. Um, all right, so moving through our agenda today. So uh, talking through each piece, we're going to do just those quick introductions. Um, we'll go over the background, both of the Innovation Zones themselves, look a little at the preschool development grant and what makes them unique, how they connect to the Innovation Zones. Uh, review the application itself, and then open up some time for question and answer. I know what we have on, a, on the call, we have about 30 people who are here with us today. They come from all over the, all over the state. We have uh, school districts, people representing the CCRNR system, different collaborations, including AOK, McV, and others, community-based organizations, and then just other curious uh, community leaders. This is our technical issue slide. I just wanted to let you know that uh, GoToWebinar is the technology that we're using today to support the presentation. If you have any technical issues as you're going, you can reach out to Renee Petrick, um, who's awesome. <laughs> and again, you can type questions in that, the question box and the chat box, and you can also raise your hand. Our session for today will be recorded. We're also going to be taking notes, and we'll have a FAQ that we will send out to help document all the questions. We'll be able to send out the, the link to the recorded webinar, the slides themselves, and then also an FAQ for you. So just to start in, so Innovation Zones, as you know, are expanding. We have an opportunity to expand to four new communities. Uh, this word cloud that we have here I think is a really nice summary of what makes Innovation Zones unique. Organizations, they work together in the Innovation Zones to enroll and serve tiny children in high-quality early learning programs. Uh, they experiment with strategies and share experiences with each other and with policy leaders. We bring training and we bring consultation to communities and to the coordinators, and then we build on what we learn. Illinois Action for Children has been leading this work in coordination and close coordination and partnership with the Governor's Office of Early Childhood Development. The scope of work for the Innovation Zones is to enroll this is just one, enroll and serve children from priority populations. And I'm just going to show you this one. It's also to improve quality of early learning programs. The priority populations that we do most of our work with would include, uh, this is a list of children who are identified as priority populations from the Early Learning Council, the All Family Serve Subcommittee, identify these populations as groups that are particularly in need. We have children of teen parents, children in homeless families, children in families of poverty and deep poverty, and then children in families with uh, DCFS involvement, children who have special needs that are identified or not identified, linguistically isolated families, and then children of migrant or seasonal workers. What we do with the Innovation Zones is that we track the number of children who are currently enrolled from these populations, along with the changes in that number over time. So we get a baseline. Uh, through the strategies and efforts and innovations that the Innovation Zones are doing, we see how we made movement in enrolling children from these populations. In addition, we work in the Innovation Zones to improve quality of the early learning program. This goal is measured by tracking the number of programs that are rated gold in Accelerate Illinois, and that's our state's quality rating and improvement system, and also with the number of programs that move up from any quality level to a higher level. So it's a big effort really to get all of our, to get our children who need us most into those programs that are really high quality. And I also want to throw out there, if you want to, if I speak really quickly, so I tend to be a fast talker, and then if you need um, any clarity, if I've moved over something too fast, if I mumbled or talked too quickly, let Renee know, and then she can send me a message to tell me to slow down. So in early childhood, uh, the innovation zones, we use a community systems approach to identify and engage tiny children and families to improve that program quality. We also use data to identify the need, to match a solution to the community need in order to plan and to evaluate and reflect. So we've done a lot of different strategies to build community systems, and we expect that new zones will be able to benefit from this experience and the experience of our first cohort to move quickly to build community systems that will support their 
for local preschool development uh, grant communities. Our, this picture that we have here for Build, Measure, Learn is a key part of how we do our work. So we use data at the beginning. It helps us to understand what the community looks like. Uh, we're really big on data, really believing that what you see is all there is, is a phrase that I use a lot. So we know what we know, and then there's a lot that we don't know, and data helps us to know more. It helps us to work with our community, to look at um, who's in our data system, who's not in our data system. We use data by telling stories and sharing experiences. We listen to families and hear what their experience of the system is. And then it also helps us to learn more. We use it to plan, we use it to implement, and we use it for adaptive learning to get better at what we do. Um, Innovation zones are community driven, and that's a really big part, and it's a key, key element of the work that we do. So it's not that the state is coming into a community and telling them what they need, it's that the community is looking at their data, talking together, there's families, there's partners, there's providers, there's leaders, who then have conversations about what, what is the state of the world of their community, and how can we be the agents of change uh, for enrollment or for good quality in our community. They're outcome oriented. So as we mentioned earlier, so our focus is on enrolling children who are in high need and improving quality. So we focus on those big goals, but we use action learning. So we use that data to get better at what we're doing to make sure that we're getting to where we're trying to go. Uh, we start, we sort of go to have a big plan and we get smaller and smaller and get more and more focused as we go to just keep improving and keep improving. So we don't add new strategies or add new strategies. We use our data to come up with a theory. We test it out, see how it's working and then we keep improving as we go. The preschool development grant, as, as you all know, is to support school readiness of children with very high needs throughout the state. The U.S. Department of Education has funded Illinois to expand services for four-year-olds with multiple significant risk factors. The grant also is to provide enhanced support for families to obtain services, include children with disabilities, enhanced parent engagement, and then also to support children who have limited English proficiency. As we already mentioned, so priority for enrollment to children for this grant, it will be for children with multiple significant risk factors. In the application, it's expected that we fill at least 80% of the slots with children who have very high needs. This could be defined with two or more significant delays, homelessness, foster care, and poverty, or other multiple significant risk factors. The school districts and other learning, early learning providers will be required to de develop and implement a comprehensive and culturally responsive outreach and recruitment plan of these children. So the grant recipients will be expected to seek out and then enroll the children who are highest risk and then serve them in a very high quality setting. We will also be looking to connect these families to health and social services as needed in order to support their health and well-being. Working with the school district, the lo local community will identify these different strategies to ensure that children who are most in need are then targeted for outreach and, and engagement. So, for example, we may think that we are already serving all of our children who are at high need and with innovation zones or even with the work that you're doing, uh, sometimes we're able to look at a map and see, oh, well, there's a pocket of poverty in this one section of the community that I maybe I knew it was there, maybe I didn't know that it was there. Um, again, going back to thinking about how we use data in planning and using strategies, we really want to figure out where the children who are most in need, where they, where they live, where they are with their families, the services that they use, the services that they don't use, and then come up with strategies to target them for our outreach and engagement. Um, part of the grant is also to ensure that some children who have very high needs will receive continuous high quality early learning from birth to third grade. And as a continuum of services from birth to third grade, um, the preschool development grant will support the four-year-old in this continuum. So as part of the Innovation Zone expansion, uh, this is an opportunity, as Teresa was saying, for enhanced intensive supports to help meet these, these ambitious goals, bold and ambitious. Uh, it's a competitive application for the preschool development grant communities, but not open for current innovation zone communities, just because we really want to expand this opportunity to, to more people in the state who can benefit from this. The application should be made on behalf of the community. It could be made by a school district, a social service agency, child care agency, the local interagency council, early childhood collaboration, 
the CCRNR, a Healthy Start grantee, local collective impact, or other organization in the local community. The supports end in December of 2016, as these are part of Race to the Top, and that's when the Race to the Top grant funding will end. And I have this note on here, so we want to plan for limited or no new funds, and I have sustainability on there for a reason. So the thing with innovation zones is that innovation zones come in and we innovate. Um, the idea is more that this is sort of a seed opportunity. You may not need new funds, but some of our innovation zones that we have right now are not getting any new funds at all. They don't have any support. This is part of sustainability because once innovation zones are gone, they're gone. We want to come into your community and help support, to help your community grow and build a community system that can live and sustain beyond. So this is not a program. This is not something that's going to um, be a it's not program funding, it's really more for technical assistance and community systems planning. So the type of enhanced support that innovation zones are able to provide is support through technical assistance and community systems planning. One way is to develop a pipeline approach to both engage and to enroll high need families. And also to connect with multiple systems, so whether that's healthcare, early care and education, different family supports, social services, all working toward the shared purpose. So we'll, we'll be working with communities to help them think this through. A lot of the communities are already doing this work, and we will be introducing you to new components of the work, whether that's through, again, the discovery process, so how do we make sure that the solution that we come up with matches the problem that is needed to be solved in the community. So sometimes the community will say, oh, it would be really important for us to have a public awareness campaign, and then they put a lot of money and a lot of effort and a lot of time invested but maybe that's not what would actually increase the enrollment of the children in need. Maybe they need more of a one-on-one -on -one touch. Maybe they need, you know, sometimes community members, we've learned from Innovation Zones, really trust other leaders. So an ad campaign on a subway may be a high cost investment with a low return, where if you do a campaign where you're talking maybe to lawyers, doctors, um, elected officials, other leading figures that your community is responsive to, you'll have greater impact, and it'll also cost you a lot less money. So just to recap, so the key component of the innovation zones is that it's collaboration, it's cross-system, data-driven decision-making, we're planning with intention, uh, our implementation we use best practice, so we try to use something called implementation science. Uh, some of that includes celebrating small wins, um, working, your, doing your work in, in chunks instead of having a 40-page, sort of the traditional way that you have an RFP, you're committed to a 40-page document, and then that's your scope of work for the next five years. But well, we really want you to have the outcomes achieved, so we want you to adapt and to update that, your work plan as needed, both through continue, continuous action learning cycles, and then revisiting your work plan every quarter, every six months, to really stay on top of the work that you're doing. Um, we plan from the future from the very beginning. So that goes to my point from sustainability. So some of our innovation zones they know from the very beginning that this is money that comes in and it comes out of supports that will be leaving the community. So they have really leveraged this opportunity, this unique innovation zone opportunity to um, take some of their early successes and their early wins and then put that into grant applications to try to get private funding to support the work that they're doing. They go out and they, they talk about the work they're doing to build these relationships because those relationships will last beyond innovation zone. We, it's the community itself who is leading and the community leaders will always be there. So I, I'm here right now, but I'm not going to be here after 2016. I mean, maybe I will, but <laughs> um, but Innovation Zone funding won't be here after 2016. And But those community relationships are going to go on. So you want to plan in your relationship building. You want to plan with your capacity building, plan with the sustainability um, as we get started so it's not something that you, you think about at the end of the project. And then we're also very tightly aligned with the state's vision. And then just to underscore again, so innovation zones are working that more high-need children are enrolled in high-quality early learning and development programs. So here's an overview of what the new innovation zones can, can expect. And all this information is actually in the grant itself, in the, or not the grant, the application itself. And if you have questions or if any of this piece is unclear, you can look through the document itself. Again, send me questions if you need any clarifying, and then we can also answer these questions at the end of the webinar. Um, so what you can expect would be training, technical assistance, and consulting using a community systems development model. The approach that we'll be using will be a job-embedded professional development approach. So our first cohort of Innovation Zones went through 
every quarter they had deliverables. This was, and that fell very fast for Innovation Zones because this grant is looking to get capacity built and enrollment for this fall that's upcoming. We're going to be learning and doing as we go. Um, and we'll go through that on the timeline. But it's really important to think that maybe you don't need to understand the big picture of what is community systems development, some of these big theory things. But we're just going to be doing the work, um, hit the ground running through a job embedded professional development approach. We'll be providing support with data collection, so forms that would be used. We were talking about how we collect a lot of data. Is there a change in the enrollment of priority populations? Those forms will be given to you at the beginning. Um, you would use them at intake or enrollment by all children, and those would be provided at the outset. We will also support with baseline and ongoing data collection, so that will take place every six months to a year, depending on the data that we're collecting. We'll also be helping core teams to focus on outcome goals to do their work in adaptive planning cycles. We also will be planning leadership training to boost the ability to facilitate either a new way of thinking, some change management. So we've learned that system change can be fun, it can be innovative, it can be really exciting, and it can also be really hard. Relationship work is awesome, it's fun, it's engaging, it's so important, but it's also could be really um, it could be really new for people. So we'll be giving some technical assistance and support to help you walk through that. Um, one of the opportunities that we have for new innovation zones would be, as an example, to, to sponsor the attendance to the McCormick Center for Early Learning or Early Childhood Leadership, their Leadership Connections Conference. So that's an opportunity that we provided to innovation zones already that they really appreciate it. So it gives them a chance to connect together and then to also get some really high level learning um, through a quality institution. Okay, so what we expect from new innovation zones is to let me see. Oh, yeah. It's to work to strengthen the collaboration infrastructure. So a lot of you already have collaborations that are in place. Um, as you go on, we would hope that that collaboration infrastructure is strong and getting stronger and being nurtured. A willingness to take risk is really important and a willingness to learn opportunities or to learn new approaches. So what we're doing is a little bit different than work that you've done before. It may feel familiar, it may, you may be getting new information about this, whether it's through ABLE Change or through collective impact trainings that you've been through. Um, it's similar and it's a little bit different. We've borrowed a bit from um, something called the Lean Startup, that's a really key element of the work that we're doing, which kind of goes back to that data-driven decision making. Uh, it's really important for us to know who, our, um, who we're reaching, sort of who our customer segment is, to use fancy business language, but we really do target our approaches to a specific person. And, and a specific group of people. Um, data collection, honest feedback is to support a feedback loop. So because where we are with Innovation Zones, we work so closely with the governor's office and all the work that we're doing. And then I also co-chair the All Family Serve Subcommittee for the Early Learning Council. And we use these different channels to help bring information from the local communities, different system barriers, different challenges that they're experiencing. And we really try to bring that up through a feedback loop and then loop information back down. It's a key part of the work, and it's been really nice to give some capacity and to give some information and, and contacts and networks to the local innovation zones themselves. Uh, we expect the innovation zones to also participate in our evaluation. So whether that's through interviews or through the data collection piece itself, and then to align with the state vision is very important. And again, can't say it enough times, um, that more children would be enrolled in high quality early learning and development programs. And so this is, I think this is something that we want to spend a little bit of time talking about so that a coordinator may be available to some of the communities. Um, but I want to point out that the work may already be funded in your community, whether that's through the preschool development grant itself, through your AOK network, a McV program, or other private source. So an innovation zone coordinator is essential to manage the implementation of the project. So this opportunity does not necessarily fund that if you already have that position there. If you don't already have that position there, then this is something that we would have an opportunity to possibly fund. Um, but there does need to be someone who can oversee and manage the scope of the work. Again, there's a lot of relationship building. There's a lot of, there's a lot of um, stuff to do. So you have to call leaders together to plan, to implement, to measure, reflect on outcomes, work with other collaborative structures that are in the community document your progress, and then have regular check-ins. So we meet as Innovation Zones. All, all of the Innovation Zones come together about twice a year 
And for this, the second cohort, the second group of innovation zones between April and the summer, you'll be coming together every month. So coordinators also need to have the authority and the skill to be able to reach out and negotiate with local organizations in the development of community systems. And also, a co the coordinator supervisor must also be closely engaged with this work for structured reflection and planning sessions to give that coordinator the support that they need to move the work forward. So as we mentioned, the application process will be open to all 18 preschool development grant communities. Here is a scoring rubric that we are going to be using. Um, the big picture for this is what, what I like to call ready, willing, and able. So you can demonstrate readiness, you can demonstrate your willingness to be a part of this experimental process, and, and that you have the ability to do that work. So whether that's with your collaboration, your leadership, the diversity of your membership, um, those are all going to be key pieces of what, what is used to define ready, willing, and able. Um, one of the questions that I've heard is that um, related to the sites in the city of Chicago, and I want to point out that the sites, if you're from the city of Chicago, you're welcome to apply. Uh, um, right now, given the application deadline, so the city will soon announce the location of their preschool development classroom, uh, but we want to make sure that if anyone wants to apply, that they have the opportunity to apply right now. The timeline that we have would be um, the application is due Thursday, March 26th. New innovation zones would be announced in mid-April. Training would take place every month, as I said, in Naperville. We're going to do those trainings in Naperville and then throughout the summer. So we would have a full day planning for action. That's what we call it. So that's the job embedded professional development approach with the core team. And then that would be the membership of um, whether it's the CCRNR, the school district, the local community-based organizations, who it is in your core team that represents the diversity of your collaboration. Um, that would be for the core team for April and May. And then at minimum, we would also want the coordinator and then the lead agency supervisor. And then if the school district and the other partners are able to join as well for June, July, and August, we would invite them to that, to attend the summer session. Um, the enrollment period would then take place and then be complete between August and September of 2015. And then in October, we would have an all innovation zone event, which is where all the innovation zones come together. There's a peer learning opportunity. They gain some capacity and learn from each other and really spend time to connect and build relationships together. And then going forward after that, so as the, as the cycle goes on for innovation zones, there would be between November of 2015 and then through December of 2016, a system scan that would go around quality goals and potential strategies, uh, work plan, checking in on your work plan every month, and then updating twice a year for us. There would be ongoing support, coaching, TA, calls, and different information that um, you would contact, go through our support team. And then again, collecting and analyzing data and engaging more stakeholders, sustaining the momentum, and continuing to do the work. And then the end of the innovation zone supports would go until December of 2016. So it's funny, I, I spoke so quickly. Hopefully it wasn't too fast. But hopefully you guys have lots of questions. <laughs> so I want to open it up right now and see if there's any questions and just respond and be available to answer those right now. Okay, so the question that we have here is, is enrollment in preschool development classrooms or is this inclusive of other state-funded programs? So this opportunity is open just for the preschool development grantee communities. I'm trying to think inclusive of other state-funded programs. That question is from Natalie. If you want to clarify that question, that would be helpful. Oh, if you want to raise your hand, then you can also, you can answer, you can ask a question. Oh, you'll try to type it in. Okay. So to clarify, if a school district in our community received a PDG grant, a community organization can apply. Yes, that's correct. So a community would be able to apply. So again, the ideal would be, oh, Sorry. The idea would be the working together, the coming together as a, as a community. So we have that the applications could be made on behalf of the whole community, and they would be submitted by the public school district, by the social service or child care agency, local interagency council, early childhood collaboration, the R&R, &R, and so on. 
on. So working in coordination would be what you would want to do for your application. It, Leah, this is Teresa. Okay. Um, so the question that, that I think someone had about, is this about um, enrollment for just the PDG, or is it about everything? So I think being clear that, that every, every PDG subgrantee is going to have to deal with how do we get our most at risk kids enrolled into our, specifically into our preschool development grant program. What the innovation zone is going to, um, it's going to, innovation zone stuff work will definitely help you with that, but it's also looking across your entire community at your full range of early care and learning opportunities and how are you ensuring that kids with high needs are getting enrolled in all, all of those. So it's looking at the zero to three year olds, the three year olds, the four year olds who won't make it into your PDG program. Um, it's making sure that all of your high quality services are fully in enrolled. Um, so it's definitely the innovation zone work is really more about the full spirit of the community system that we've talked about in the PDG grant. It's not just about those slots for the preschool development grant. Uh, that's helpful. Thanks, Teresa. Okay, so I have a question here that says, if these communities that already have funded collaboration coordinator positions are expected to have an innovation zone coordinator, um, at 30 to 40 hours a week, how would they balance the workload? For example, if they have an AOK coordinator, how would that fit in with work that they're already doing? So to use the example of either AOK or McV, so we know that both AOK and McV have a scope of work that is defined, and sometimes um, we have different collaborations that have been working together for a long time. Maybe they have a strategic plan that they've been doing. We would really want you to, to um, I'm trying to think of the right word for it, but to, to really align the effort, to align the outcomes, align the purpose, so that it's not duplicated work. It would be work that would be seamlessly integrated. Um, the AOK team, if this is something that they agree is a fit for them, they would they would work in close partnership between the AOK, your AOK, um, exactly what is her title? So Ana Maria, mm -hmm. plus the local. So Ana Maria and I would work closely with your community um, to make sure that everything is an, al is an alignment from the very beginning, to make sure that it's not too much work that's going on, but that it is in alignment. So we don't want to have any duplicate funding or duplicate positions to, to have any redundancy. We really want this work to be tightly aligned. We have a question, do we need MOUs submitted with the grant or just signatures? So just signatures would be okay. If you have MOUs that are already in place, that would be beneficial. It would help us see that um, the strength of the collaboration that you already have in place. All right, again, if we already have an AOK network with a coordinator of the zone, that is correct. So that would be working. Or um, if the AOK does not apply, so if it's another community partner, for example, if you have the CCRNR, if you have another partner, Maybe there is a lead person that's there, but they need to work very closely with the AOK network. Okay, so someone has also asked the question, so if CPS is one of the pre-K expansion sites and your community isn't selected for pre-K expansion, can you still apply for this opportunity or must you work with the city? So if you are one of the sites, Okay, CPS, if your community isn't selected, I would still suggest that you apply. Um, one of the things that we want to play with, so after we get this, this cohort kicked off, we want to look at is there an opportunity to do modules of this opportunity to give some strength and enhancements to other communities who maybe do not receive the opportunity to be another Innovation Zone expansion site. Okay, are state leaders with McV in support of using McV coordinator for the innovation zone? That I would want to clarify before giving. Um, Teresa, do you have any thought on that one? So the question is, are state leaders with the with McV program in support of using the McV coordinator for the innovation zone? I think 
that if there is a McVie community that's interested in doing this work, then um, we should have a, a conversation with the, the McVie team in my office about that before you submit your application. Um, I'm, I'm sure that we can be supportive of that. I just think that we would want to work with you. And I would say that, and Teresa, you can clarify, um, I think that would apply with AOK -okay as well. So if the community has an AOK -okay yeah. network. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And they want to know, can they apply for funds to hire a coordinator if the AOK -okay network is not the applicant? So if they are working, I think it's, it's definitely a conversation to be had with the AOK -okay team and Innovation Zone team to make sure that there's um, great alignment in the work that you're doing. Exactly. And remember what Leah is saying too, that this is, this is very short term resources. So we don't want to be, um, we don't want to be layering on to other and creating parallel systems to what is longer term resources in your community. Uh, we want it to, to be more one and the same rather than new layers. That's right. Okay, and then I just want to ask if there's any more questions. Um, feel free to submit your questions using the chat box or raising your hand, and then we can unmute you to give you a chance to ask the question that you want. Okay, so we have a question. Is there money that will come to community groups who apply other than for a coordinator? if those funds are needed. So the way I would answer that question is that um, I would really point out, underscore that this is, this is not a new program. These are not funds for a new program. The bulk of what we're trying to do is to provide technical assistance, coaching, and supports to help the community think through a community systems development approach and to really come up with different strategies to, to make a difference. If in their strategies it's determined that some seed money would be beneficial, um, that's something that we can talk about. But the, the bulk of this is really to support the opportunity for communities to build their local capacity to be, to be stronger in the problem solving process to get the kids enrolled in high quality early learning programs. And Teresa, do you have any other thoughts on that? No, I agree with that. Okay, we have another question. Is there any information on funding amounts? No, we don't have that information available. Um, what we really want to focus on is not so much the dollar amount, and this is the same information that we gave to the first set of innovation zones, to really not think about this in terms of dollars. Um, the, the big frame, the big picture of this is really a lean startup. So you're starting lean, and you're experimenting, and you're testing, and you're seeing what works and what um, what strategies are working for improvement. So we don't want to think about, well, if I had X thousands of dollars, then I could do this, that, and the other thing. We really want to see what we can do with our existing infrastructure. So some of our communities do have um, some infrastructure that's in place. A lot of folks, and Kathy Store has done a lot of great work on this, looking at the collaborations that are there, and are they doing all that they can do. So we really want to help look at the resources that are in a community, leverage what exists, and really bring that, that capacity together to work towards this outcome of more kids enrolled in high quality programs. If we put out numbers and say, well, then, then someone is likely to, not, not anyone on the phone, of course, <laughs> but um, just in, in general, I mean, it's easy to say, well, if I had X thousands of dollars, then I would maybe, I don't know, spend it on a public information campaign. But again, asking, is that what the community needs? Does the community need a public information campaign? We really want to focus our efforts on doing a discovery process, 
to understand what is the barrier, what is getting in the way of our kids who are most at need or at risk from accessing these important programs. I mean, we know these programs are really going to benefit them, and there's a lot of different barriers, so whether that's a system barrier, whether that's an individual barrier, whether that's, we want to think about the things that we can control, the things that we can respond to within the existing resources that we have. Um, okay, so we have a question from Stacy Adams. We're going to unmute you for a question. All right, Stacy, you are unmuted, so you can go ahead. Can you hear us, Stacy? Oh, you'll have to unmute yourself. I'm sorry. You'll have to hit that on your phone. Can you hear me? Now? Yep, we can, can you hear me you. now. Yes, we can. Okay. I understand that. Okay, I understand that the grants funds a position to actually do this work. But what about support of a data system or some sort of structure, technology-wise, that would be needed to do this work? Is uh -huh, that that's some? A great okay. So what we've been trying with our current innovation zones again, since we're working on a lean budget, is we try to use things that are free, so or something that's already existing. So if there are big databases that already exist. Um, we're working to understand more about current database systems, whether that's through a referral network or intake. A lot of what is being done, the information is collected on paper, and then we're using Google. So Google has, whether it's spreadsheets, Google Forms, there's some database capability using um, some free resources that are available that can be shared within the communities and that have been modeled by other organizations so we, we would give you information on how other people do that. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so we have about 15 more minutes. I want to just draw one more call for questions. And then if there are no more questions, what we can do is have you submit any extra questions to, via email. So you can submit them to me. Um, I realize that my email is on the next slide here. Sorry. So for more information, you can contact me, Leah Powell. And my email is leah, L-E-A-H, dot Powell, P as in Paul, O-U-W, at actforchildren.org. So that's pronounced Powell. People a lot of colleagues are curious about how I pronounce my last name. <laughs> And we'll just do one last call. Okay, great. Well, we really want to thank you for taking the time. Um, we hope to, oh, when will the FAQ fact sheet be available? So we will have that avail available for you within, before, next, before the end of next week. Okay, so for your next step, the first thing would be to send um, an email of intent to apply, you can send that to Leah. I'll let Teresa know. We'll compile a list so that Teresa is um, aware of who is also looking to apply. Submit your application via email by March 26, 2015. Again, if you have any questions, you can send me um, an email. The webinar will be available for later view. We'll have that link. So as soon as the recording is over, the link is available. So we can send that around right away just to make that easy for you. And then we'll have the FAQ um, available later. OK, so without further ado, I really do, again, want to thank you for your time, and if you have any questions, you could just reach out to me.